Hello everyone, welcome back to this channel. So in this video, we're gonna look into the laws that Newton has created about motion. And these are some of the terms that you will learn in this chapter. And before I continue, I just want to encourage everyone to subscribe to this channel if you want to know the latest video. And your subscription will also mean that more people get exposed to this channel and get free education. And that will be the only favor I ask from you. Thank you. And this is our chapter outline for this video. Without further ado, let's go into Newton's second law. Newton's second law says that the acceleration of an object is directly proportional to the net force acting on it. So the first example here shows that the harder the baseball player hits the ball, the ball will accelerate faster. And that's the first thing. And Newton's second law also states that the acceleration of an object is inversely proportional to its mass. So assume that I were to touch this balloon here, it will accelerate. But if I were to touch this elephant, he's not gonna move. And that's because of Newton's second law. Because acceleration of an object is inversely proportional to mass. An elephant has a big mass, so that's why I can't move it. So for Newton's second law, there's a formula to express it mathematically, which is f equal to ma. We learned it in IGCSE already. So let's solve some real questions here. A boxer punches a punching bag with 2000 Newton, and the punching bag is 100 kg. The acceleration, we can just substitute all the known quantities into the formula, and then find out the unknown quantities. So in this case, it would be 20 meter per second square. So uh, another question here. So this skateboarder is 50 kilogram and the skateboard is 10 kilogram. So she move at a forward force of 150 Newton, assuming there's no friction. What's the skateboarder velocity after four seconds? You first have to find out what's her acceleration. You have the force, you have the mass. By the way, you have to add 50 to 10 because that's the combined mass. And then you will be able to find out the acceleration. So with the acceleration, you can find out the skateboarder velocity after 4 seconds. So A is 2.5, T is 4, U is 0, what is V? So use the equation of motion and you would have find out the final velocity. And then I think that's the hard part of physics. Sometimes you do need to use multiple concepts. So make sure that you memorize the equations of motion. And sometimes just think critically about what topics are related in a particular question. And the distance that the skateboarder has traveled in this time, again, this thing is one of the quantity in the equations of motion. That's why you can use another formula. So you have A, you have T, you have U, and you want to find S. Sorry, that's a typo, it should be S. So the S here will be found, can be found using this another formula here. Substitute, find the answer. All right, now let's introduce you to the different types of forces available. Push and pull forces. Weight, which is the force exerted by gravity. And friction which is the force that opposes the relative movement of two surfaces. Drag, which is sort of friction, but it happens in fluid, like air and water. So I have an F1 car here, so that you can see how visually there is a drag here that is slowing the F1 car down. Upthrust is a force that is exerted by the water. It occurs because of the difference in terms of pressure. So if you remember what we learned about pressure in IUCSE, the pressure at the bottom will be greater than the pressure at the top. And the difference of pressure here create a net upward force on the object's weight. So that's what we call up thrust. Contact force, so that's the force that prevents you from falling to the ground. So that's when two objects physically interact with each other. Tension is the pulling force transmitted through a string, a rope. Right, now let's dive deeper into each force. Weight. Weight in physics is the force exerted on an object due to gravity. I have Duran tree here to illustrate that. Weight will act on the center of mass of an object. So we will learn more about center of mass in the next chapter, but you can now assume that it's the center of every object. So that's when all the force will be acting on. Now, a quick quiz about weight. Which Duran, the big one or the smaller one, will fall to the ground first? Three, two, one. And the answer is they will fall at the same rate because gravity accelerates all objects equally regardless of their mass. At this point you might be wondering, but we do have some objects that fall at a different rate. Why does a feather drop slower? And that's because of air resistance. Because of the surface area of this feather, which is bigger, and it causes the feather to slow down. Alright, so that's how weight works. Now, Let's derive the formula for weight. A recap about acceleration in free fall is the acceleration caused by gravity. And because of acceleration, when you release a ball, it will accelerate and move towards its terminal velocity. And because of that, we know that there is a force acting on a fallen object. And the object has mass, it is also accelerating. So we can calculate the weight 
which is the amount of gravitational force, by this formula. Weight is equal to mass multiplied by g, so which is acceleration free fall. Given this formula, you can then calculate the weight of every object if the mass is given. So in this case, what is the weight of the durian? You can use w equal to mg, 3 times 9.8, 29.4 Newton. So that's the amount of force that gravity is acting on that durian. That's a comparison between the acceleration happening on Earth and on Moon. So you can see that if you were to release the same ball that has the same mass, the ball will accelerate faster on Earth. So this is some differences in terms of the unit of mass and weight, the symbol and the definition. Right, regarding mass and weight, assuming that we have this bug moon buggy here on the moon, because their mass is the same, it is made out of the same amount of matter no matter where you put it, it's not harder to move it. It is easier to lift this car on the moon because less gravity is exerted on the moon buggy. So that's something that you can use to remember the difference between mass and weight. Right, now we have talked about weight, mass. Let's move deeper into mass and talk about inertia. Let's look at this diagram here. When you push a crate, the crate moves. When you push the acceleration pedal, the car moves. And when you kick a ball, the ball moves. When you stop exerting force, they stop moving. So can we make a conclusion that a force is needed to keep an object moving? 3, 2, 1. And the answer is no. Because there are times, even when the external force is removed, the object will still move. For example, when you hit a hockey puck with the hockey stick, upon hitting it, the hockey puck will still move on a frictionless surface. So we cannot make the conclusion that a force is needed to keep an object moving. Instead, we have to look into the inertial before we come up with a formal conclusion. So inertial, it's the tendency of an object to resist changes in its state of motion, meaning it will continue to move at a constant velocity or remain at rest unless acted upon by an, an external force. So what happens here, as we look at the elephant just now, why is it that my hand can't cause it to move? Because of its mass. It has a lot of inertia, and as a result, it has a lot of resistance to it changes in motion. So a characteristic of inertia, the heavier the object, the higher the inertial and the harder it is for us to move them unless this part will only stop if they are acted by an external force and at this point you might be wondering but why then when I remove my force then they stop moving and that's because we have an external force acting on them called frictions what if there's no friction technically the object should move forever let's conclude that an object at rest will stay at rest unless acted upon by an external force if you don't touch it they will not move and the second conclusion is an object that's moving will always move at constant velocity same speed unless acted upon by an external force like friction and that is exactly what Newton's first law says stay an object at rest will stay at rest an object in motion will continue to move at velocity constant velocity unless a force acted on them so this law can be explained by this formula without force there will be no acceleration regardless of the mass let's look into some example we can explain why cars reach a top speed upon a certain point using Newton's first law. So this is an F1 car, this is its top speed. Even if I were to step on the acceleration pedal, at one point, it just can't go any faster. And why is that? And that is because at one point, when the forward thrust is a lot, let's say you keep accelerating the car, the speed will increase. And because of the increase in speed, air resistance will increase to a point where forward thrust is equal to the air resistance. So that's a diagram to illustrate. When your forward thrust is more than air resistance, you accelerate. When air resistance is higher, decelerate. But when both are the same, that's when you read constant speed. They just can't make it move faster anymore without reducing the air resistance. So this is what I talk about. The balance create a point where the car can no longer accelerate, which is what F1 engineers, they are always trying to do. They're always trying to reduce the amount of air resistance so that the car can get faster and faster. So another example about balancing forces is free fall. When you do free fall skydiving, you will accelerate because the weight is greater than air resistance. And just like the F1 car, as you accelerate, your speed increases to a point where this increment in speed increases the air resistance as well. And as a result, that's when, when your weight and air resistance equal, that's when you get to the terminal velocity. So terminal velocity is the maximum constant speed at which a force of gravity pulling an object downward is balanced by the air resistance. So free fall, and when you open the parachute, 
you increase the air resistance a lot, that's when you decelerate and land safely. So this is the velocity time graph of a parachute disc. So you're going to move very quickly until you reach terminal velocity. And when the parachute is released, your speed drops tremendously. That's all about the different types of forces. And now we'll talk about another forces called resistive drag, resistive force. So we have two types of resistive force friction, which we already talked about. And drag is a force, resistive force that happens in a fluid like air and water. So let me explain how drag is experienced in water. As you swim across the swimming pool, you will feel this. The water is slowing you down and an underwater submarine will also encounter drag in the water. So if you drop something into the water, drag will also slow the object from sinking. So these are phenomena that happens frequently. Maybe not the submarine, but other thing is something that we experience. So I'm just trying to bring real life example into what you. So drag can also be experienced in air. We have air resistant. So this aircraft wings is used to reduce the amount of air resistant and improve efficiency. So cyclist helmet, you can see that it's pretty aerodynamic. This is also to prevent the air resistant from slowing the cyclist down. Parachute is um, increase, but the moment you open the parachute, the air resistance is increased. So that's drag and resistive force. So let's solve some question regarding the force here. This skydiver is 70 kg and it experienced a resistive force of 650 Newton. Gravity is this amount. What is the net force? And we can calculate net force by just minusing two different forces because they are in different directions. And if you want to find the acceleration, you just use the force given and the mass and then find the unknown A. You would have found that this is the acceleration of the people. Again, we are combining multiple concepts to solve one question. So next up, another force is the contact force. That there aren't a lot of things I can talk about. It's the force that is encountered by two objects interacting with each other. And this contact force arises from inter forces. So that's contract force. So in liquid, a boat floating on water experiences up thrust that supports its weight. That's why it doesn't sink. Whereas on the air, it's hot air balloon is the one example here. So you can read the description that I've written here that explain what creates up thrust in, in fluid. Now, let's look into Newton's third law of motion. It says that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction and forces always comes in pair. I'm reading it, but I'll explain it in a while. If one object exerts a force on another, the second object exerts an equal and opposite force back on the first. So let me give you some example of what I mean here. Say you have a gun, gun recoil, and the moment the bullet is fired, there will be a slight backward force on this gun here. And why is that? And that's because of Newton's third law of motion. Because of the forward force you created, a backward force will be created as well. But in this case, the gun actually moves a lot slower than the bullet, which makes it safer to be used. That's because of its mass. The mass of the gun is a lot heavier than the mass of the bullet. As a result, its acceleration is less than that of a bullet, according to Newton's second law, F equal to ma. So that's how we combine different concepts together. Rocket propulsion. is The rocket expels exhaust gases downward. Why is it downwards? Because they are trying to create an equal amount of upward force that propels the rocket forward. So this is, again, Newton's third law in action. Last example. When you're running, as you forward, your foot will have to step backwards. And that's, again, Newton's third law in motion. In order to create a forward force, you need to create an equal amount of backward force. As we go into chapter five, when we look into momentum, you will see Newton's third law surfacing it up again. But this is just an introduction. So SI unit here, last subchapter, they are essential in physics to provide a standardized measurement. So to cut it short, it means that we hope all the engineers in the world, they use the same unit so that when we are communicating, there's no confusion. Everyone used the same unit. So these are the seven base SI unit in A-level physics and their symbols. Feel free to take a look, but definitely we're going to look at them when we learn about the topic like current and thermodynamic. Okay. So there's a difference between the base unit. These are the base unit and the derived unit. So some terms, they are not base unit, but they can be derived using base unit. For example, Newton here can be calculated using F equal to ma. And the unit for m is kg, and acceleration is meter per second square. So 
one newton is also equal to one kilogram meter per second square. So this is what I just talked about here. And here are other units that get derived from the base unit. Speed is equal to distance over time. So you can see the base unit for distance is m, time is s, meter per second. Pressure, force divided by area. If you get that unit, you simplified it, you would have gotten the unit for pressure. Another concept in A-level physics is the idea of homogeneous equation. Equations connecting different quantities need to have matching base unit on both sides. If the unit don't align, the equation is incorrect. For example, I created this formula, force equal to mass times velocity. How do we know whether it's a valid formula? We can just put that unit together. If I were to use force equal to mass times velocity, then this unit of force will be kg and meter per second. So you can see that the two equations, they don't match with each other. It explains that the equation is wrong. Let me give you another example which is correct. So for kinetic energy, this is the formula half mv squared. One joule is defined as the amount of energy transfer when one newton move an object one meter. So this is the work done formula that learned in IGCSE. So we know the unit for force is kg meter per second square times m. And when you multiply together, you get this unit which is exactly the same unit as half mv squared. m is kg, v squared is meter squared s squared, because meter per second square is squared, right? So hopefully you understand what I'm talking about here. Just comment if you don't, I will try to answer you. And that's the end of this chapter. We talk about different types of force and their unit and equation. In the next following chapters, we are going to combine them together. And that's the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.